My name is Lakeisha Johnson. I'm the director of the Office of Student Life, and I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural UT Health Science Center Voices event. We are really glad that all of you came tonight. Before we move forward in our program, I want to acknowledge a few guests in our midst. Um, I'd like to first give a shout out, if you will, to Dean Weiss, who is the Dean of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. I missed something. Right there, there you are. I was looking for you. There he is there, so please give him applause. I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Adriana Segura, who is the Student Affairs Dean for the School of Dentistry. And I'd also like to acknowledge John Kalfas, who is the Senior Director of Student Success and Title IX Director. And now I'd like to invite up to the stage area here, Dr. Jacqueline Mock, who is our Vice President of Academic, Faculty, and Student Affairs. This is great. Walking up the stairs, I felt the same thing that John did and when he and I were chatting. Wow, listen to that buzz. It is really great. I love that you are all here in this wonderful building, in this wonderful room, to really have a chance to explore, to gather together, to learn from each other because that is really where we are headed as a health science center, to really build a community, to build an interprofessional community, to get us to a place where we not only see each other in the hallways, in our classes, but across schools and across communities. That's the next stage of development and evolution that we have for our health science center. And you, as the inaugural class, to help us think about Health Science Center voices are the ones that are going to help lead the way for us. And so I'm so grateful you are here. And a particular shout out to the other partner with Student Life who helped organize this, Dr. Teresa Evans. <laughs> great introduction. Thank you again, Dr. Mock. Okay, so we're going to get the show off the road, and many of you are here not even knowing what the show is, so thank you for believing and coming anyways. So you're about to hear some amazing stories, and yes, I'm a bit biased because I know all these folks very well, and I had to beg them to share these stories with you, but I want you to know that every single one of you has an amazing story and that's what started this whole program. Was that you walk to Starbucks and you shake the hand of the person next to you and you realize that they too are on a journey and we're on a journey together. And so that's the moral of today's event. Learn about each other, make new connections, and hopefully be inspired by these stories. So I'm gonna call up to the podium, our first two stories. And I'm sorry about the folks back here, but we will try to make eye contact with you, okay? So our first two folks are Essen Chowdhury and Jody Gray, and they come from our Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. So will you please come up to the podium, the two of you? Thank you, Essen. Thank you, Teresa. Oh, wow, there's so many people here. This is exciting. Uh, so my name is Jody. I am a second year PhD student in the Radiological Sciences program. And that's going to be the only time I introduce myself that way. Uh, because within Radiological Sciences, what I actually study is medical physics. Uh, everyone has heard of radiology. Um, but if you say medical physics, you're going to raise a lot more eyebrows. You're going to spark a lot more conversations when you say that. So. I'm Jody. I'm studying uh, medical physics right now. Uh, tonight you're going to hear lots of really cool stories from my colleagues uh, about the day that they woke up and knew they were going to be a scientist. Uh, my story is a little bit different. It's a story of someone who was interested in what seemed like way too many sciences all at the same time and trying to find her path. So I studied physics as an undergraduate uh, because of as a subject. It's pretty broad as far as sciences go, and for some reason I was good at it. I don't know how that happened. Uh, and I also studied philosophy 
Uh, it turned out that I enjoyed thinking about science just as much as I enjoyed doing it. So subjects of philosophy of science, theory of mind, these things were just as cool to me as the physics that I was learning in the classroom and in the lab. So by the time I graduated, uh, I had heard of graduate school, I'd heard of getting your doctorate. It sounded like a cool thing for me, but if I could only narrow down what it was I wanted to study. Uh, so I wasn't ready to make that leap yet. So I was sworn into my institution's uh, master's program for computer science, even though I'd never written a line of code in my life. They just said, you'll be fine, just go for it. Um, I was fine eventually, and it turned out that I loved computer science too. So it seemed like I was casting an even wider net for myself, but luckily amid all of these studies, um, I did go to a conference where I heard a woman uh, give a very cool presentation on medical physics. I'd never heard of it before, uh, but I did more research, I heard about Utesca, and then I ended up here. So an antiquated definition for what medical physics actually is, uh, very generally, any time that you have radiation in medicine, you want a physicist present, and that happens quite a bit. Um, our program is about four years long, so we do about two years of coursework, your qualifying examinations, and then research for your dissertation, uh, then you're done. Uh, many of us will go on to take boards and complete residencies, much like uh, medical students do. Uh, and then when you're done, there's about three general things you can do as a medical physicist. Uh, the first would be if you want to bring home the big bucks, uh, you can be a therapy physicist. Uh, they work alongside oncologists to help plan radiation treatments for cancer therapy. Uh, another major branch of medical physics would be that of health physics. So that is maintaining radiation safety in places like UTESCA and in hospitals and whatnot. So our own uh, environmental health and safety officer here at UTESCA, uh, Dr. Michael Charlton, he is also a certified medical health physicist. Uh, so in addition to making sure we do safe radiation practices here, he's also the person who gets called when someone in the dental building burns a bag of popcorn and the fire trucks have to come. So please pop responsibly, everyone, for Michael Charlton. <laughs> Um, and then the other major sect of uh, medical physics would be that of imaging physics, so using radiation and other new things nowadays to image the human body. Uh, so what I get to do, I work over in the Research Imaging Institute. I get to do all of the cool things that I really like. Perfect intersection. Um, I do data mining on massive amounts of brain data in people who suffer from depression. Uh, just a really cool intersection of all of these fields. Uh, I do have quite a passion for mental health, uh, research and mental illness. Uh, it's kind of a mysterious field right now, so what we're doing, studying the physical mechanisms and markers we can actually see in the brain for people who have these disorders, I think it's gonna be big news someday, and UTESCO is the perfect place for me. I'm glad I'm here. Thanks, guys. Wow, that's going to be a tough act to follow. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Essen Chaudhary. Cameraman, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to follow me around. Uh, he's going to hate me. Um, first of all, I want to uh, thank Teresa, Charlotte, uh, Nicole, and Lakeisha for helping put this together. Thank you very much. We need this. I'm a student in the Translational Science PhD program. So when I told somebody about my degree, uh, what I'm seeking it in, this person asked me, oh, so what language are you studying? <laughs> and I said, no, nope, sorry, I'm not translating Swahili into English. I'm studying a multidisciplinary science. So translational science was started here at the Health Science Center about five years ago. We have a pretty small class, and the purpose of translational science is basically a little bit of what we're doing here today. It's the interprofessional uh, interaction between scientists, physicians, dentists, physical therapists, to try to find innovative discoveries to some of the most chronic and some of, some of the most uh, critical care needs uh, in terms of disease that we have today. So translational science looks to try to speed the discoveries in the clinic into uh, discoveries at the bench side to treatment in the clinic, and then assess which of those treatments in the clinic are most effective, cost effective, and to try to make best medical practice guidelines based on that. So in a nutshell, that's basically what we do. So as scientists, we're kind of experts in our field, but we are also liaisons into the other sciences. So we try to hook people up, so to speak. 
So it's non-traditional, much like me. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. Um, I graduated Texas Lutheran in 1999. That's a long time ago. <laughs> uh, I came to Utusca to do research. I've done research here before I was a student for about 10 years almost. And then I was also in the Guard. I was a Chief Warrant Officer. Uh, and I was a chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear tech. So as a, yeah, that's a mouthful, say that three times fast. So as a warrant officer, I was an expert within my field, but then at the same time, I was a liaison between the officers and the enlisted. So that was a perfect fit for my translational science program. It was very non-traditional. And so I continued my research, and uh, I originally thought that I wanted to go to medical school, be an emergency room physician, go with the special forces around the world. But then I met her. And she said she probably couldn't be with somebody who's deployed all the time. So I had a tough decision to make. I chose her, obviously, right? <laughs> So then I thought to myself, okay, if not a physician, what do I want to do? I want to have patient contact. I want to have interaction with patients. I want to work in a multidisciplinary field where I can talk with people from different disciplines, try to work on something innovative. And so fortunately, the translational science program was started here at the Health Science Center. So I applied, I got accepted, and never in my life have I felt so supported and welcomed as I have in the graduate school and the translational science program and here at Utusca. And so on a daily basis, I get to interact with people who have a drive and a vision that's greater than mine or at least equal to mine, and that's inspiring. All of you have a vision. All of you have a goal that one day you want to put to work. You're going to be playing a critical role in healthcare, And so we all have different areas that we're experts in. So if we learn to communicate in, our, in an interdisciplinary way, come to the table, talk, become friends, we can get a lot done for the critical care needs that we have in healthcare. So real fast, um, I've been fortunate to kind of find my life's journey, I think. Uh, I am involved in some science communication things um, because science belongs to us all. The problem is that a lot of scientists don't necessarily communicate science as effectively as one would hope. Um, and that's the fault of some scientists. So, you know, uh, to, be able to, to be able to do that, you have to be able to speak clearly, you have to be able to communicate what you're doing in a way that's accessible to everybody. And so fortunately I was involved in an event called Science Fiesta that Travis Block over there helped organize along with Milos Marinkovic. Um, and so that was a great way of getting involved in the science communication portion of it. Uh, currently, I'm also working on trying to set up something that's related to crowdfunding for a lot of young scientists. Try to get biotech built in San Antonio. We have a great biotech city. A lot of people don't know that. And so to try to get the word out to show them how wonderful the Health Science Center is as a part of the biotech industry in San Antonio is critical. Uh, another interest of mine is innovation through public-private partnerships. So fortunately, there has been, I, I have a friend who's a CEO of a startup company here. He's bringing his technology into the Health Science Center, and it's a technology that helps scientists manage big data. We, in the world of genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, a lot of big omics, a lot of big words, but basically we have a lot of information we don't know what to do with. So he has software that can help scientists manage that better. Uh, I also work in a, um, in a technology consulting group so, uh, that, that works with the Office of Tech Commercialization. Excuse me, Tech Commercialization. And so we try to help bring some of the newest discoveries at the Health Science Center to clinics and to try to bring them to consumers so they can find that treatment quickly. But I think the most important thing is that we have to work effectively as a team to be able to tackle these problems that I was talking about. It's our responsibility as contributors to healthcare, each one of us, whether you're a physical therapist, a dentist, a nurse, a physician, we all have a responsibility not only to patients, 
but to ourselves as professionals across disciplines to build the kind of relationships that we need to carry this forward and to find you know, treatments and cures for cancer and diabetes and heart disease and all the kind of maladies that are out there. So this is only one of the reasons that we need to reach out across schools, across disciplines, and to try to understand each other's life journey. And I think that this is a great form to do that. Thank you. Now we get to hear two wonderful stories from the School of Dentistry. Welcome to the podium, Marinay Cabrera and Casey Cass. Good evening. Thank you all for being here tonight. I think this event is so cool and I was so honored to be asked to speak tonight. My name is Marinay Cabrera and I am a third year dental student soon to be fourth year. We have one more clinic uh, week left, so I'm super excited about that. Uh, I'm also really excited to be representing the dental school. Uh, there's so many amazing colleagues of mine, people who are fourth years now who are about to leave, people who are third years, second years, first years. Everyone has a really cool story. Um, I'd like to think that my path to dentistry is a little bit non-traditional. I didn't grow up knowing that I wanted to become a dentist. I didn't have a dentist in the family. I had a lot of dental work done, but I didn't exactly love it. Um, and so the only thing I really knew as a child was that I loved fixing things and making things better and finding solutions to problems. And the earliest memory that I have of fixing something was a long, long time ago, back when I was around seven years old, and our doorbell was broken. And so, this is back in New York. I'm a Yankee, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> but um, I begged my dad, I said, Dad, please take me to True Value, I wanna, I wanna fix it. And so my dad took me to the hardware store and we got a new doorbell and I went home and I installed it and I fixed the problem. And the satisfaction that I got out of that was incredible, which is ultimately what led me to choose a career in engineering. So I went to college up in Pennsylvania, a small school called Lehigh University. <laughs> yeah, Lehigh. And, um, and I studied bioengineering. And after Lehigh, I went um, back home to New York and I went to grad school at NYU and I studied biomaterial science. And what that basically is, is studying materials that people put inside of their bodies. So that was actually my first foray into the dental world without even realizing it, because I was studying things like titanium for dental implants and zirconia for crowns and bridges. And so through that, after NYU, I took a job with a dental implant company. And my role was product development engineer. So my job was to design products for dentists to use. And it was cool, it was fun. Um, but my favorite part about my job was not actually sitting behind the computer and doing all the 3D modeling. It was taking the prototypes, which was the very last step of the process, and going out to local dental offices and working with dentists. So I would just kind of give them the tool and say very little because I wanted it to be intuitive and I wanted them to kind of know how to use it without having to pick up a manual and read how to use it. So. Um, when I realized that going out to the dental office was my favorite part of my job, I kind of had this moment of, oh no. <laughs> so I called my sister up, who uh, she's a couple of years older than I am, and she was a fourth year medical student here at UTESCA. And I kind of explained my quarter life crisis and I said, gosh, I think I, I, think I wanna switch careers. And she was, very supportive. And so looking back, I'm very thankful that I had a family who was my biggest cheerleader. Everyone was very excited that I was excited about a new career and they were um, big fans of me, you know, going back to school. And so a couple of years later, here I am, about a year away from graduating with a degree in dentistry. My favorite part about dentistry is that I'm doing what I love. I'm finding solutions to problems, but this time it's for people. And that makes it all the more gratifying. And 
we have patients at the dental school who come in and they're embarrassed to smile, but we have solutions for that. We have patients who come in and they're in pain, but we have a solution for that, and they can leave our school that day no longer feeling that pain. We have patients who really need a good cleaning, and we have dental hygienists, thank you girls for coming tonight, who make their teeth super sparkly clean. So we have solutions for all of these different dental problems. So speaking about the dental school, we have a brand new clinic. I don't know, how many of you are familiar with the building? Yes, so it's beautiful, it's big. <laughs> and inside of this school, we have dental students like me and Casey and everyone here. We have dental residents, which are, they're parts of programs that I know Casey is gonna talk a little bit about. Uh, we have dental hygienists. And we're all here to solve dental problems. But the really cool thing about this is, and I don't know how many people in this room know this, but as a Uteska student, you can become a patient at the dental school with the additional benefit of having 30% off of the already discount price. <laughs> I feel like it's just an infomercial all of a sudden. <laughs> if you sign up right now. No. Uh, <laughs> but you have the, the benefit of getting really good care from students like me who care about our patients so much and um, it's, at, it's at a really good price. So I know as students, we're all kind of in that boat of student loans and, and how serious those loans feel. So just a little plug for dental school. Um, but yeah, a dentistry, I'm so happy that I'm here. I'm so happy that I get to solve problems for people every single day. And if you have a problem, then you know where to go. Thank you. All right, I uh, just want to thank everybody for coming out as well. Um, it's a great turnout for an awesome event. So my name's Casey. I'm also a third-year general student, like Marinade mentioned. Um, and I'm going to tell you my story about how I got to be here. A um, couple things about me first. I, um, I'm very detail-oriented. I like helping people. I like working with my hands. And I'm also, you know, I consider myself to be fairly artistic. Um, so I'll come back to why those are important later. Um, so like Marinay mentioned, I didn't you know, know that I wanted to be a dentist since I was this big. Um, kind of wasn't sure what I wanted to be. Um, but around about in high school, um, I remember a trip to my dentist and he talked to me and was kind of showing me some before and after pictures of cases that he had worked on. Um, and to see those people's faces, the difference between the before pictures and the after pictures, and you could legitimately see the excitement in these people's faces about how how much better their smiles were and how much more confident they felt about themselves. And I just felt that was really cool to see that, you know, in a photograph right there in front of me. Um, and so I think that kind of started the fire for me about, you know, me and dentistry. Um, so after high school, I moved down to New Orleans, Louisiana and spent the next four years of my life in that amazing city. I, um, I was on a Navy ROTC scholarship there at Tulane University. So I uh, studied cell biology while I was there. Um, but since I was going into the Navy afterwards, um, you know, I, I enjoyed New Orleans, we'll put it that way. So that was, um, that was a fun time. And so following that, um, you know, I had to, it came time to pick a place where I was gonna go with the Navy. And you know, I had to choose, choose the difficult place to go so that no one else would have to go there. But I picked sunny San Diego, California, <laughs> moved out there for the next four years of my life. And uh, I did what, you know, pretty much any 20 something would do. Lived a few blocks from the beach, surfed, kayaked out in the Pacific Ocean, and went and snowboarding up in the mountains near LA. So it was a rough time living out there. Um, <laughs> but I also, um, you know, I worked here and there with the Navy as well. Um, and I was on board ships. So as officers in the Navy, there's kind of three main categories that you can go into. Um, there's a lot of other ones as well, but the three kind of big ones, you can be on a submarine, you can be a pilot, or you can be on ships. And so I picked going into ships. I couldn't see very well, so I couldn't be a pilot. Kind of wanted to do that, but. Um, so I picked going on, going on ships, and the kind of technical term for that is a surface warfare officer, um, which is kind of a catch-all because they don't really look at what you did in undergrad um, for what job they throw you into. So in the four years that I lived in San Diego, I was on two different ships, and I worked with a lot of different guys. Um, engineers that ran the ship's main engines, uh, electricians, uh, computer IT guys, um, so a whole range of things. So I learned a lot of things about the guys that worked for me and like what they did. So it was a great experience. Um, 
After, you know, after living out there for four years, uh, it was time for me to take a desk job, actually, away from a ship. So I took a job that brought me back here to San Antonio. Um, and that kind of re-engaged my, my interest in dentistry, because I knew the school was here. You know, while I was out in San Diego, I never really lost touch with my interest in dentistry. I would talk to dentists on board our ships, um, in the dental clinics on base, um, and things like that. You know, I'd pick their brains, kind of observe when I could, and things like that. So came back here to San Antonio. Um, actually became a dental assistant because I wanted to make sure that dentistry was really what I wanted to do. So got that. Um, and you know, the Navy taught me a lot of great things. It was a great experience, but I always felt like I was kind of missing something. And those details about myself that I mentioned before, you know, getting to work with my hands, you know, that detail oriented kind of thing. I was just kind of missing that with what I was doing with the Navy. And so, you know, becoming a dental assistant, you know, I liked what I saw, and so I just kind of decided to make the jump into dentistry, and the last three years have been incredibly rewarding. Um, I'm getting to use all those things, working with my hands, helping people, um, you know, doing a little bit of artistic stuff with, you know, fixing people's teeth and putting them back together and things like that. Um, so it's just been a, a very rewarding time, um, and so, I, you know, I couldn't have made a better decision. So a little bit about the dental school. It's a four-year program. The, the first two years are pretty academic intensive. Um, we do a lot of book stuff, studying, things like that, a lot of exams. Um, we learn how to build teeth out of wax. We learn how to work on teeth that are actually plastic teeth, you know, removing things like a cavity or a simulated cavity, um, prepping plastic teeth, you know, if we're gonna put a crown on them, things like that. So we learn that within the first two years, and then the third and fourth year, we actually start working on our own patients, um, real live people. So, um, you know, we're taking cavities out, giving people dentures, um, all kind of things. And so we do that the, the following two years, and so that completes the four-year program. And then um, from there, once you graduate, the, um, there's, there's kind of an exit exam that's a pretty wild time. You have to find a live patient. Um, they've got to have you know, just the right size cavity, not too big, not too small. Um, you hope that they show up, because if they don't, you're kind of in big trouble. But um, so that's, that's kind of the exit exam to get your license to become a dentist. And then from there, there's a multitude of directions you can go. You can actually go straight to work if you wanted to. Um, you could go work for a corporate dentistry chain. You could work for um, somebody else, you know, looking maybe to retire in a couple years. Um, if you've got all the money in the world, you could build your own building and start, you know, working on your own if you wanted to. Or you could go into um, a whole host of residency programs and, you know, become a specialist. Um, there's things like oral surgeons that can do anything from taking out wisdom teeth to reconstructing somebody's face potentially after a car accident. Um, there's endodontists that do root canals, um, pediatric dentistry working on little kids, um, periodontists kind of take care of gum disease and get your gums nice and healthy after maybe somebody kind of let that go for a while. Um, what am I missing? Uh, orthodontists do the braces. They don't really, you know, orthodontists is kind of we like to think of it as black magic. They don't really do as much of the dentistry of like taking out cavities and things, but they move your teeth around and they make them really pretty and they like to keep that secret. So, um, so you know, once you graduate from dental school, there's a lot of different directions you can go, but it's, it's really a great field and I'm proud to be part of the dental school. So. Now we're gonna move on to the School of Health Professions. And can I have Gail Tabo Tabo and Kim Kaliza join, uh, uh, join me here in the front? All right, thank you. Hi, my name is Gail Tabo Tabo. I'm a second year occupational therapy student in the School of Health Professions. And as proud of how I am to be an occupational therapy student, I could go on and on and on about how amazing OT is. And I would have, you know, like I learned that when we are to come here, we're actually supposed to talk about ourselves. This is super awkward, right? Like who, who's ready to do that? But but this guy, this guy is. Uh, um, well, everybody likes to talk about themselves, or at least should be pretty good about it, because you're the expert on yourself, right? Or you should be. Um, well, it's also important to know that everybody has a story to share, and everybody wants their story to be heard. Like, that's a huge thing, right? You want to be heard. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you guys came here for the free dinner and maybe the free t-shirt as well, but we're here to connect with each other, find out what kinds of things we have in common, and learn about each other. Um, 
as you don't really have much of a choice, but you're here to listen to me and I'm really grateful for that today. <laughs> okay, so some humble bragging type stuff. Um, I've jumped out of a plane. I swam with sharks in Hawaii. Um, rappelled down a waterfall in Mexico a couple years ago, and then have also been hypnotized at one of those <laughs> dinner comedy show things. Yeah, that was, that was a good time. But okay, so seriously though, I graduated with my biology degree at University of Texas of Austin, hook em horns. Yes, thank you. Um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Okay, that's fair. If you did when you were 17 and you picked your majors, Good for you, because I, I, didn't, I didn't know that. Uh, I actually entered UT Austin with a chemical engineer major. Did not think like an engineer as much as I tried. I couldn't. I just couldn't. Um, I looked into pre-pharmacy for a little bit. I even got a decent grade on, or different decent score on the PCAT. Also not for me. <laughs> For like a hot second, I looked into PT, but that passed really quickly. Um, <laughs> but I, I just wanted to graduate and get out of there. So I got a degree in biology. Um, the first seven years out, I worked at a pharmaceutical contract research organization. I started out in sample inventory, worked in the lab a little bit. So CLS people, I know, I know what you're about. Um, <laughs> Uh, worked in project management and then eventually some quality control. While doing that, you know, I got a decent salary. It was cool. I liked my work, but I knew in the back of my mind there was still something more that I wanted to do. I didn't really know what it was yet, though. Um, but my subconscious did. Have you guys ever had recurring dreams? Yes? Okay, what about the one where you're in what position you're in right now? and you realize that your degree is bogus and you actually have to go take your history final tomorrow. Yeah, Ever, nobody? Okay, well what about the one where you wake up and you realize the last six weeks, six months of your uh, classes, you actually slept through entirely and you need to take an exam in two hours. Okay, these dreams haunted me for like months, months I had them. So in the back of my mind, I knew I needed to do something more. I knew I wanted to go back to school. I didn't know what for yet. So what I did instead, challenged my body instead of my mind. I did my first 5K, and that runner's high, super, super intense, right? Like, it, and, and addicting. So I did my first 5K. Then I decided I was going to sign up for the Dan Skin Women's Triathlon in Austin. I conned a couple of my coworkers to come do it with me. That's a lot of fun, you know, get people, what is it, if you, you struggle together, or I can't remember, I'm really nervous. Um, okay, so, so, they did it, so they did it with me, and then that led to my next couple of sprint triathlons. And then I decided I was gonna do the MS-150, so I was gonna ride my bike from Houston to Austin, and it was gonna be a grand old time, and it was. I loved that stuff. I loved getting together with, my team and training together and putting together the training schedule and encouraging each other. Do you ever think about what kinds of experiences you've had to bring you to where you are today? Because I did, but I didn't understand the purpose of them until I realized how happy I am to be where I am today in the occupational therapy program here at Utesca. And, and you think about those things and you just have to realize like, they brought you to where you are today, and they made you who you are. So everybody has their story that they want to share, right? So we're here today. The, the planning, the competitive nature that I have also got me involved in the Allied Health Games, the School of Health Professions Allied Health Games that we had a couple weeks ago, right? So that was a lot of fun. I'm sure there's at least one person at every table that you could talk to about it and ask them how awesome it was. But I liked being part of the planning committees, volunteering, but I also liked being out on the field. I hope you know right now that you are looking at the two-time spoon egg champion of the Allied Health Games. Really good balance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyway, my point being, everybody has a story. Everyone at these tables has an incredible background and things to share, so take the time to talk to each other and share those stories and hopefully make some cool connections tonight. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, I for one am so glad Gail went first because she completely took care of the introduction. Um, my name is Ken Kaliza, and uh, I'm absolutely happy to be here. I'm gonna make a, a deal with you guys, okay? I promise I will not be shy if y'all promise y'all will not be shy, okay? So what we're gonna do right now, I'm gonna ask you to stand up. Please stand up. Wait, 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 wait. You guys are great listeners. No, please stand up if growing up, you've always known what you wanted to be and you're pursuing your career right now or you're already working in that career. If you've always known, please stand up. All right. That is awesome. Um, since keep Stay standing. Hold on, I'm not done with you. All right, so while you're standing, um, congratulations to you guys. Let's go ahead and raise the roof two times. I'm serious, let's actually do this. Let's raise the roof two times for y'all, all right? Come on, raise the roof, let's go. One, two, perfect, guys, awesome. Go ahead and have a seat. All right, for the rest of y'all, if you've just recently figured out what you've wanted to do, or what you want to do with the, with the rest of your life, please stand up. Within the past couple of years, don't be shy. I'm actually standing up already, so I'm kind of cheating. But don't be shy. All right, so I promise I'm not going to make you guys do anything as old as raise the roof, but we are going to go ahead and hit the dab on three, okay? One, two, three, dab, boom! I'm just glad I wasn't the only one that did that, okay? So, <laughs> a little bit about myself. I'm Ken Kaliza. I'm from Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm Filipino. Ro <laughs> Woo, yeah! And uh, grew up in a very conservative family. Uh, my mom was a nurse, yes, yeah, so that stereotype kind of follows through here. Uh, but my family wanted me to become a doctor. They wanted me to work in the medical field. And why is that? It's because of, you know, you have your job security. You're helping people. And um, it's just great. They can brag about having a, a son that's a doctor. That's, that's amazing, right? Well, I didn't want that. That's a whole lot of pressure growing up and having to deal with that, all that pressure. So with that in mind, what did I do? I did the most responsible thing possible. I went and got my bachelor's degree in psychology, <laughs> right? Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense, I know. But hear me out. The reason I did that was because I think I was a little bit emo. I didn't, I didn't go to Hot Topic all the time, I promise I didn't, but, <laughs> but um, I wanted to understand myself as a human being. I wanted to understand the human condition. I wanted to understand why people interact the way they do with each other. So I went ahead and did that. And I could have taken the easy route, and I could have gone on to study more psychology in uh, postgraduate, right? That would have been the easy thing to do, would have been safe. Instead, I decided to pursue a master's in sports medicine. Excuse me. The reason being is I wanted to complement my knowledge of the human mind with the human body. So while I was getting my master's in sports medicine, I learned three things that have stuck with me and kind of influenced my decision to eventually pursue physical therapy. I didn't know it at the time though. Those three things, strength and conditioning, right? Gainesville, yeah. Um, <laughs> muscular imbalances and corrective exercise. These three things right here kind of influenced me. I got my degree and I went ahead and became a personal trainer at 24 Hour Fitness because I wanted to just get, get the ball rolling with my career. I'm coming to you guys because you guys feel you're in the dark. You're in senseless. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, I'm coming to you, don't worry. So while I was a trainer at 24 Hour Fitness, I had a blast. Um, you know, I, I could have I taken, taken that as my career and ran with it. Uh, my boss was one of my clients, so I told him what to do three times a, day, three times a week. It's pretty awesome. I was also trainer for the vice president of talent acquisitions for the entire company, right? So I could have ran with this, but there were two things missing. One, the, the, the sense of fulfillment, okay? I loved exercise, I loved training. I find it fascinating. The second thing that was missing, health insurance. <laughs> for whatever reason, 24 hour fitness could not get my health insurance together. So when I was given the opportunity to work as a physical therapy technician by a family friend, I jumped on it. I didn't say it was because of the health insurance, but boy, did, that's the main reason I did it. <laughs> Working over at the physical therapy clinic, I got to see physical therapists in action. They taught me that you can, you can treat movement dysfunctions with exercise. That is mind blowing to me because I already love exercise. That's, that's amazing. I almost cursed, sorry. So, <laughs> so that's amazing to me. I also got to understand why patient therapist interactions are important and how you develop that 
with empathy, putting yourself in their shoes, seeing the struggles that they have to go through and trying to fix that. Finally, I also was able to get some free rehab for the various injuries I sustained in the gym, okay? <laughs> so, being a genius, I, <laughs> with all this in mind, I thought to myself, I didn't think to myself, wow, this is a career I want to get into. That's not what I thought. I was a genius, so I thought to myself, man, exercise is awesome. That's it. That's all I thought to myself. So one day, my physical therapy friend of mine came up to me and goes, Ken, have you ever thought about a career in physical therapy? I looked at him and I said, no. Why? He said, because you would be great at it. I said, okay, well, I'll look into it. And he said, you should. So I did. And I applied, got into Utesca, loved the family atmosphere over here. Everyone's very welcoming. I jumped on board. But the thing with this, guys, is that there's a, there was a whole lot of self-doubt because I'm thinking back to all the physical therapists that I saw in the clinic. They're all super sharp. They're very good with human interaction. And they can think very quickly. And most of them are really, really ridiculously good looking. Right? So what am I doing? Why would I do this? I took that chance at that opportunity after getting into Utesca, and I have loved every single second I have been here. I love this school. I love the program. My class is my family. And the opportunities to work with patients, mind-blowing. So I guess what I'd like for you all to take home with you today from this story is that it's okay to be afraid. It's absolutely okay. But never let your fears and self-doubts prevent you from becoming someone extraordinary. Thank you. And you think you've heard some amazing stuff already, but we got more to come. So can we bring up the two students from the nursing school, Xavier Grizel and Tabitha Higgins, please. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Xavier Grizel, and I'm a third semester senior from the School of Nursing. I'm at the traditional track, and I'd like to share with you a personal story as to why I chose nursing. So um, in 2008, my wife and I were stationed in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. She's in the Navy. She's currently a chief in the Navy, and she was pregnant at the time. And Unfortunately, in January uh, 2008, my son was born at 31 weeks premature um, with an underdeveloped lung. The hospital he was born in was the size about half of the school library right now. It was only two stories. And the closest hospital was Jackson Memorial in Miami. Um, they had to get, uh, they had to call stateside for an airplane to medevac him out, and we had to wait 12 hours for that one. Um, it was a very scary moment at the time. Um, by the way, at that time, I was a firefighter in Guantanamo Bay for the Navy as a civilian, though, not as a military member. But it was a very scary time for me, and it was just very, very hard, and all I could think about was how awesome the healthcare team was because it's it was like death was was lingering right over my son and as I look into the room I saw life and I and at that time I kind of knew you know it, it was gonna be okay so after we moved from Guantanamo Bay and went to San Diego I pursued firefighting but something inside me was like, you need to do more, you know. So I went to college there in San, Antonio, uh, San Diego for business administration and also my fire protection degree. About two years in, I realized this is not what I want to do, you know. So by that time, we, we were now being stationed in San Antonio. The drive from San Diego to San Antonio is about 24 hours, and, and I am very cheap. 
like ex <laughs> <laughs> extremely cheap. I mean, I would, I will drive that 24 hours nonstop <laughs> because I don't want to pay for an hotel. <laughs> My wife hates it. So um, on that drive, you know, during that journey, I was just thinking, man, I, this would be the perfect opportunity to just start anew. And two days after I got here, I decided, you know what? I'm done with firefighting. No disrespect to firefighters or families here. <laughs> but I, I decided, you know, I, I wanted to do more. And it felt like it, like it was just a duty. It was something inside of me burning to do more. So I applied to the nursing programs. But in San Antonio, uh, there's only like three or four that's really accredited for uh, undergrad in nursing. And UTSCA really stood out to me, you know. And I did my prereqs at UTSA, and I got accepted here after two years, which is a very competitive program. I think the last class was 90 students got accepted out of possible 550. So it's a very competitive program. And I am very satisfied and happy of my decision that I've made. I've, I've met some awesome people here. And OK, so I see the sad faces. My son is awesome now. <laughs> <laughs> He is, however, a comedian, and he is probably the silliest person I know. Last week, he has asthma, but it's okay, and you know, it's, it's under control. Last week, he had an, a reaction, and I said to him, take two puffs of the red one. And what that means is, his albuterol is red, and his other steroid, oh, uh, puffs is in a gray, you know, container. So I said, take two puffs of the red one. And I saw him going up the stairs like this. And I said, what are you doing? And then he just looked at me. And I said, what are you doing? He says, I thought you said take two red popsicles. <laughs> and, and, I, I, and this was at 2 a.m. with a crust in his eyes still. <laughs> and, I, and I said, why would I tell you to take two red popsicles? <laughs> I say, take two puffs of the red one. And he was like, oh, that's what you said. But, but, but with that being said, you know, I, I think my choice into going to nursing was the right one for me. And, I, and intrinsically, it felt very good, you know, to, to provide that type of care that was provided to me and to pass it on to other families that are really in need. Because as nurses, we are the last line of defense in, in all the healthcare. We are the one that give the medications, we check the patients, we assess them, we let everybody know what's going on. And it is a great responsibility and I take it with pride. After graduation in December, I, I will graduate this December and uh, I, 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 I am positive I will go into pediatric nursing. And specifically, I really want to work in the nursery because I want to be like a personal teddy bear to all those, ba <laughs> to all those babies. You know, uh, I, I like burping babies. I, I like changing diapers. I, I like to feed them. It, it <laughs> So, you know, it, it is good. And, and the staff in the nursing school is, is very supportive. And one of the things I told my wife was, it's like all my teachers are like my moms and my grandma. <laughs> no, they're awesome nurses. They nurture you. Like, like seriously, they really do. They, they bring us cookies. Today they have, <laughs> you might hear my accent. I'm from Jamaica. Um, they brought paletas today. And, and coming from Jamaica, I don't know what a paleta is. So I was like, oh, maybe they have chicken and beef. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought a paleta was similar to like a flauta. <laughs> so I was like, oh, chicken and beef. And then there was, I, it's a popsicle. 
but, but I had two strawberries anyways. But, but it, it was a, the School of Nursing, it, it's, a, it's a very, very, very awesome school with awesome staff and awesome people that's uh, currently in there. And, you know, um, yeah, that's pretty much my journey so far. So thank you guys for listening. And, you know, I think I want to thank you guys also for putting this on because it is an awesome experience to have that interprofessionalism that we really do need, you know, because we do stroll across the campus and I might recognize a face, but I've never stopped to talk to that person and, and know who that person really is. And as the healthcare team, we need that communication as early as possible. So thank you guys and keep rocking on. Oh. So uh, it is Nurses Week, so if you, if you guys could just wear nurses rock badges all week, it'll be awesome too. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tabitha Higgins. I'm also a senior at the School of Nursing. Um, and like you've heard from many people, I didn't know, well, I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up, but this wasn't it. <laughs> I, um, I always wanted to go to college, um, and I wanted to study the stars and the planets. I was at Nerdy Kid at lunchtime when it was indoor recess, and I read about planets. Um, you know, and unfortunately, um, my parents didn't go to college and didn't have the financial means to send me. So I said, well, I'll go into the Air Force, you know, get the GI Bill, and, you know, maybe I'd be closer to NASA. It's a government organization, right? That would get me in there. Um, and so in 1991, I met my husband, and we got married. And um, in 1994, we were blessed with two um, beautiful babies who were extremely premature. They were 28 weeks gestation, given only 24 hours to live. And for three months straight, we had hours at a time. Um, my um, daughter did just fine. It's a boy-girl twin. Um, you know, she has a few um, quirky learning problems, but other than that, she is in college. She's contracted with the Army. She's doing great. Um, my son, um, he had a grade 4 intraventricular brain hemorrhage when he was two days old. So for most people, um, they don't survive if you are not an infant, you know, and you have your fontanelles to kind of allow for swelling. Um, he also um, had seizures. He had uh, chronic breathing problems. And so, you know, um, over the years, he grew into some of his medical and physical disabilities. As a young mom, I was only 23 years old. I had to get out of the Air Force because, you know, somebody needed to be at home. And so I had to learn how to go, you learn how to use a suction machine, give him oxygen, give him round the clock nebulizer treatment, sometimes two hours at a time, um, feed him by G tube, give him IV medications, manage a seizure disorder, later take care of a trach and a ventilator, and give him daily OT and PT, and also be his teacher and his educator. And I also had another baby. You know, and of course, being in the military, my husband was still active duty. We weren't anywhere near family or friends. So I had a huge learning curve. Because when I grew up, it kind of sounds a little crazy, but my parents were like, soap, you know, just put your hands underwater, rub them a little bit, and you're good. Well, you go from that to the learning curve that I went through, and it was a, it was a really steep one. So um, then we started, we had two more children after that. And so as our family grew, um, learning how to manage schedules became very complicated. My husband was deployed a lot, and so it was just me and my little rugrats and going to appointments, five, five appointments a week. And somewhere I managed to go grocery shopping and get a little bit of sleep. I didn't get that much sleep, though, because sometimes I'd be doing laundry and I would take out the dryer sheet and put the whole box in the dryer and be holding the sheet and realizing something was wrong. <laughs> Wasn't sure what. Um, but finances were always also hard um, because a lot of the things weren't covered under um, in for our insurance and so we went to the Social Security office and their best advice was my husband and I needed to divorce they said if you just divorced you wouldn't have his financial means anymore and you could continue to care for your child without any problem 
Well, David said no way, because I probably wouldn't remarry him. So <laughs> we decided to just stay married and get through it. Um, so in 2009, um, my son had a surgery that went really bad. It was to save his life. We had a 50-50 shot. Um, after three weeks of fighting in the hospital, he had, um, he had acute respiratory distress syndrome, DIC, multi-organ system failure. What I learned in class since we've been going, he probably had sepsis. At the time, it wasn't called sepsis. Um, and it, it took me a long time to find myself because my life, even though I was a mother of four, it was very entwined in my son's care. And um, so that was really difficult for me. Um, and then I decided that, you know, God didn't teach me all of these things to, you know, to be compassionate and caring and the skills that it takes to do the things that I did if he didn't want me to still continue to use those skills. And frankly, some of the nurses and other medical people I dealt with became like family. They really helped me through some hard times and educated me a lot so that I could take care of um, my child. So um, I picked myself up, started my pre-nursing um, at uh, Northwest Vista, which was kind of crazy because my husband and I have been married 25 years and probably nobody in my class was 25. <laughs> so I learned about things like um, quote sandwiches when I'm trying to write my English paper. I'm like, what is that? And then apparently there really is imaginary numbers I thought they were just in my checkbook, but apparently they do exist in algebra. So, um, and then I, all, I knew I wanted to go to Utesca. I, every doctor that I had ever talked to, every nurse I ever talked to, when I started thinking about nursing, they always said, are you going to Utesca? I mean, it has an amazing reputation. Um, and then I went into our sim lab. And if you haven't been, you've got to check it out. It's really cool. We have these um, great mannequins that can breathe. They have pulses. They can cry. They can deliver babies. It's kind of scary, though, because if your instructor's in a bad mood, it could be like the exorcist. I think the head will just start spinning, and I don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> um, but I remember my first day at orientation, and Dr. Bird said that we need to learn a new way of studying. Well, I was like, I got this, right? I mean, I had high A's in Northwest Vista. I'm, no, I'm going to have no trouble until I had my first test. And then I decided, you know what? All these great things that they have us, for us at our school, like SI sessions and tutoring sessions, those are kind of important. <laughs> I better take advantage of those. And I learned that it's not about memorization anymore. It's about applying all the things that you learn and you're taught. The program is difficult and demanding, but it's also amazing. I, I really love our instructors um, when we're having a hard time with something or just a bad day. They are all nurses at heart and they're caring and so they take you under their wing and you know they talk to you and help you through. Um, Mr. Ermer likes to tease me because my hair is always going gray if I don't get a chance to get over to get it done and I'm like, look, this is what the school does to me. It's bad. Um, I have volunteered at the refugee clinic here in San Antonio, which is a student-run clinic. And I, I really highly recommend everybody look into this clinic. It's amazing. We have people from all over the world um, come into this clinic, and they really need our help. And we have nurses. We have nursing students, medical students, dental students. They're all collaborating together to help make these people get the best care that we can give. Um, and basically, in closing, I just wanted to say um, the phrase that takes a village um, is so true when it comes to patient care. A team of physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, OT, PT, speech, dietary, pharmacy, we all work together, but also remember the family. Um, they are part of the team as well, and they're the ones that are gonna help you make sure that your patients are doing what they need and get the help that they need to be able to be compliant and come and get what they need. Um, every person has a special gift whether it's the tiniest baby or it's your oldest patient, they all have something to teach you. They all have a story. And if it wasn't for my son, I would never would be going into nursing. Um, so when you come across a family member and you just don't think that they'll be able to learn or get it and you're like, oh gosh, you know, I gotta teach them again. Remember, I was only 23 years old. I didn't have any understanding about anything. 
And now I'm in my senior year at UTESCA, and I'm getting ready to be an RN, and I can't wait. So. We are blessed for you all to be here. Thank you. And let's move on to our next set of speakers. Thank you. All right, so they come from our School of Medicine, and they will close up the evening, so brace yourselves. We have Tanner Campbell and Mecklen Reagan. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, my throat's kind of sore. It's a long story. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess I'll start off talking about the long journey to becoming a doctor that we've all heard so many awesome things about. Um, so you have to go to college, you have to get your bachelor's degree, then you go to medical school, get your MD, then after that you're not done, you have to go to residency to choose a specialty, and then sometimes that's not even it, you have to do a fellowship training to further specialize in your field to become an expert at whatever you end up doing. Why would anybody want to do that? <laughs> That's what I'm here to talk about, um, because it is very important to me why I am here and doing this, and it is so much more than just money or prestige or getting somewhere and being proud about it. Um, there really is a source of that. Um, and I just want to thank you both that just went for sharing y'all's stories. I just, I love hearing stories of how God uses a tragedy and redeems it for something truly beautiful. I really appreciate listening to that. Um, and that's kind of a good segue into my story and how I'm here. Um, my faith is, actually, is absolutely at the center of why I'm becoming a doctor. Um, God used something tragic in my life to truly transform it and give me a purpose and a path and a, path and a direction. Um, and uh, whenever I was in sixth grade, um, me and my dad and some friends were trick-or-treating on a golf cart. It's really weird. Um, <laughs> And I was too young at the time to really understand, but the driver of the golf cart had been drinking, and he decided it would be funny to swerve. Um, and I was talking to my dad, and I watched him tumble off the back and hit the side of his head. Um, and a sixth grader, it's what, 12 or 13? Um, and I watched that happen, and I remember running to his aid and seeing this giant pool of blood hit my dad unconscious, like right in front of me, and like, my first thought is, oh my gosh, I just watched my dad die and I'm at his side. And the feelings of need and desperation and just helplessness in that situation, I will never forget what that felt like. Um, and I saw the emergency team, the EMS get there and they rushed to his aid and the, whenever he got to the ER, the ER docs, they stabilized him and they uh, got him ready for surgery and then he went and had brain surgery. Um, then he was in a coma for a month. That's a long time to be in a coma. You're not supposed to be in a coma for a month. Um, and I remember the ICU doctors, and he had a rehab team once he came out of the coma. Uh, the doctors actually told us that um, he uh, probably wasn't going to wake up. Um, we started need, need to start thinking about pulling life support. Um, that was very tough as a family to deal with. Um, it's pretty miraculous. The next day he woke up after that conversation, um, and he didn't know who he was. He didn't know how to function, how to talk, anything. Had no memory. Um, and then over the next nine months, I saw his whole recovery process. I saw teams come in and deal with him. And after like nine long months of frustrating and stubborn patient work, um, he's actually fully fine. Uh, he does manual labor for a living. Um, he's back at that. Um, and he has a tiny bit of short-term memory loss, and that's it. So seeing the uh, medical teams just mobilize and uh, care for my dad, someone that's so close to me, uh, whenever I needed him most, just like changed my view of my life. You know, I wanted to be a veterinarian and play with animals all day. It was my dream before that. Um, but, uh, you know, God just showed me that I can do that. I can meet that need for people one day if I pursue medicine. And other people are in this situation every single day, right over there in that building. Um, and everyone here will be a part of that one day. Um, and that's truly inspiring to think about. So, like, who are we to be able to do that for people whenever they're in those times of helpless need? Um, and I'm just super excited to be a part of it. Um, I actually am choosing to share with y'all the whole story because last Friday, like five days ago, six days ago, um, my dad had a heart attack, the same one. 
Um, and uh, he had a full STEMI, uh, two arteries completely occluded. Um, and they rushed him to the hospital. Uh, and he had, a, he had a stents put in a surgery within like 20 minutes of getting to the hospital. Um, he's fine. So my dad, my dad defies the odds every time. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's still close to my heart. And I remember that feeling again um, on Friday. Like I could not do anything. I wasn't even in the same city as my dad. And health professionals, they got him better. And we needed him so, needed them so much. Um, so that's, you know, kind of my motivation. And I know every healthcare professional has something like that. Why you want to go into it is something that happened to you that touched you and you wanted to be a part of that for other people. Um, so thanks for listening to my story. And here's Macklin. Hello. This is an interesting setup. I now see why everyone was walking. Um, my name is Macklin Reagan. Uh, I'm a second year, uh, almost third year medical student, maybe after I finish boards. Um, so for me, growing up, um, I, my younger brother James was about 21 months younger than I am. Um, and we were, we did everything together. You know, you're about the same age, you go to the same schools, uh, you play all the same sports, all kinds of random things that siblings do together when you're that close in age. And I can remember being about five years old, holding his hand, <laughs> my parents have all these cute pictures around the house, you know. You're walking, walking your little brother into school, right? You'd walk into his classroom, and anytime he would get sad or something, the, his teachers would come and get me out of class so I could sit with him and cheer him up. And uh, it was funny to us, because 15 years later, not much had changed. We ended up going to the same college. And uh, there we were together again. I was helping move him into his dorm and uh, showing him the ropes around campus. Um, so just after James's 13th birthday, he was diagnosed with a form of bone cancer called osteosarcoma. It's a deadly form of pediatric cancer that after about seven and a half years of treatment, took his life. Um, and James and our family, we were very lucky, very lucky. With five-year survival rates of metastatic osteosarcoma being less than 10%, James got seven and a half years. And I mean, lucky is not a word you use when you talk about cancer, but we do because we feel very fortunate to have had all the time that we did. James had a remarkable team of doctors, surgeons, nurses, physician's assistants, occupational therapists, physical therapists, even a special dentist who worked tirelessly day in and day out to extend his life and to provide him with the greatest quality of life possible. So during all of that time, um, I learned a lot about pediatric cancer. And I think after watching so many children, just like James and his friends, our friends, die, I couldn't really imagine doing anything outside the realm of pediatric oncology. It's an area that lags far behind in treatment and cure rates simply because there aren't enough kids diagnosed with cancer for pharmaceutical companies to see putting research dollars into new treatments as profitable. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> I hope to make a positive impact in pediatric cancer care. Utesca was a great option for me. It's close to home. I'm from Corpus Christi. And Utesca is also home to the Grihi Children's Cancer Research Institute. And their focus is on the genomic causes of pediatric cancers. The idea being that if you can find, sorry, I know you guys are back here. <laughs> the idea is that if you can find the cause behind these pediatric cancers, you can develop better treatments. So you can ideally cure these, these kids, and they can go on to live full lives. As far as medical school goes, <laughs> Tanner, Tanner gave you a really brief synopsis of kind of what the road looks like for us. I'm going to talk a little bit more about medical school in general. Um, so I'm sure you feel the same way. Medical school was nothing like I could have imagined it. As a matter of fact, I'm sure most of you feel the same way about your various schools. <laughs> um, the, our first two years, we do mostly basic science. We do all basic sciences. It's all classroom learning. We get some clinical experience, but that really comes later. Um, the level of of detail, of intensity, was beyond anything I could have imagined. And so that's our first two years. Between the second year and the third year, we study to take 
the first part and by far the most important part of our licensing exam. It's called step one. Um, Tanner looks fabulous and relaxed because he took his already. <laughs> um, oh yeah, no, seriously. <laughs> Um, and then after STEP, things get really exciting. We start our third year, and that's really where our clinical learning begins. Um, we get some exposure, like I said, in our first and second year, but it's nothing like third year. That's where we really get to treat our own. We don't have our own patients. There's a lot of, a lot of oversight there, for good reason. Um, but, uh, but it's very exciting. And then we also, around that time, decide what kind of doctors we want to be, what we might want to go to residency in, um, or fellowships, et cetera. And then we go on to fourth year, where we're actually applying to residency. You're finishing up your graduation requirements. You take the second part of that licensing exam. Uh, you go on away rotations, residency interviews. If you want to, even, you can do um, an extra rotation, say, in some field of medicine that you're not particularly interested in, as in practicing your entire life, but you find it really cool. Um, so that's also an interesting opportunity. Um, I think, for me, before I got to Utesca, I couldn't comprehend the idea of learning enough in a classroom setting to be able to do the kind of work that I saw doctors and healthcare professionals do for my brother. But after having been here for two years and now working on planning possibilities for my future, I'm confident that the education each of us is receiving in our respective programs will not only prepare us to do the kind of work that we've seen the healthcare professionals we all admire do, but it also inspires us, each in a different way, so that we're more eager to get to doing the work that we came here to do than ever before. And events like this are even more important, as you've heard all of my colleagues mention, because today, medicine isn't just, I'm going to see my doctor because I have a cold. I'm going to see my dentist because I need my tooth fixed. It's all of us working together as a unit, and we're more, it's easier for us to do that by getting to know each other through events like this. So thank you guys so much for coming. All right, so keep the applause going because now is the thank you time, right? So I could go on and on and on, but I don't want to steal your thunder because each of you that shared your stories today, and I've told you before, are so brave. So thank you one more time, one final time, for your help and for sharing your stories. <laughs>